Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Rilston. I'm your host, of course, and we're recording on a Monday afternoon. And after a week which was dominated by XL bullies in the news headlines, uh, Brighton bullied Manchester United at the weekend and won 3-1 at Old Trafford. And I'm joined here today by my colleague Tyrone Marshall to dissect that pretty poor performance, wasn't it, Tyrone, it's fair to say. But before we get into it, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I'm good. Nice to be in the office very early on a, on a Monday morning. But yeah, beyond that, I'm, I'm not so bad. I think the earliness was also why I just fell up the stairs. I will mention that before you uh, before you embarrass me in front of all the listeners and, and tell them. So yeah, I think, I think I'll blame that on the bleary-eyedness. If we had that on camera, that would be brilliant <laughs> to, to overlay that. Um, because it was quite, quite the spectacle watching you stagger up those stairs as we made the way to the podcast studio. Anyways, Tyrone, enough of the pleasantries into football because there's plenty to discuss today. Um, uh, look, it's a terrible result, really. I think supporters went into it and they, they probably shared the worst, which Brighton are an excellent side, but Manchester United should be doing better um, against Brighton and Hove Albion. I think Brian Clough once said, people only go to Brighton for, for toy press conferences. But they're now a really good side. Um, but how concerning was the manner of the defeat, Ty? You were obviously there at Old Trafford. And I always like to get your initial thoughts, really, when you left the stadium on, on Saturday evening. Yeah, I, I mean, very concerning. Um, my, my initial thoughts when I left the stadium on Saturday evening were uh, that I'd actually got the prediction right. I'd, I'd forgotten about this. But the um, one of our colleagues, Jamie Jackson, asked me beforehand predictions. And I said, eh, 3-1 Brighton. I feared the worst for United. And, and so it proved. Um, and yeah, just... I just felt it was entirely predictable, really. It looked like one very well-coached team with a clear tactical plan, a clear structure, everyone knowing their roles, no matter who the players are. I mean, that was a long way from being Brighton's best team. That Their, their, their front two was Danny Welbeck and Adam Lallana. Uh, you know, their, their left-back wasn't even in the squad. No Ferguson, no Enciso. Um, you know, how Pedro on the bench... Who's their record sign-in, their new midfielder, Carlos Balaba on the bench, Billy Gilmore on the bench. A long way from Brighton's best team, and they dominated United. I thought they they were the better team, the more composed, the more technical team. Um, and yeah, it was concerning for United. I think it said it all that Brighton went into that game just playing the way they do. No matter who the personnel are, they can make five or six changes, not have their best team. They just play the way they do. Whether it's Welbeck and CISO, Pedro, Ferguson starting up front, they know what they do. They drop into midfield, they drop deep, they give the centre halves a problem. The fullbacks know what to do. Whoever's playing centre half knows that you encourage the press. They just all know their roles. United switched formation, played a diamond midfield, a 4 4 2 with the diamonds, and it, it just didn't really work. I know Ten Hag said it did. I thought it, it arguably did for 15, 20 minutes. They started the game pretty well, to be fair. And it was a, even in those early stages, it was a really even game, then a really good game. But the the problem was always going to be, you play that diamond midfield, the the opposition fullbacks haven't got a direct opponent. And I thought all three goals essentially came from the fullbacks. Lamptey got two assists in the second half. The first goal came from Veltman having time on the right. Ericsson couldn't get to him, couldn't get out to him in time. He could play a, Quick forward pass into Danny Welbeck, who'd done that thing of dropping off the centre half, concern there, and you, then you've got you've got problems. Um, yeah, I, I just thought Brighton were the better team by by some distance, to be honest. I mean, that's the thing when you see they came out so well. Regarding like starts to the game, that's the best of start a match yeah. I can remember in a long, long time. What on the front foot they were positive. It was intense. There was a high tempo to the game, and they look really threatening. And I mean, this happens time and time again where. They create chances, but they just don't take them. And eventually, it's going to come back around and bite them. And it, of course, did. Uh, Danny Welbeck, again, familiar face. Should have just put mortgage on him scoring, really, yeah, again. Pascal Trafford. Gross, it's yeah, always they love scoring goals yeah. against United, don't they? I mean, like you say, that that goal goes in. And I think from that point, Tyrone, from, from my perspective, I don't think United kind of responded. They didn't look like they were capable of getting back into it. I know Hoyland scored before half-time, obviously. We'll, we'll come on to that. But I think after 30 minutes for me, it, it was clear something had to change. And I think you just discussed the, the diamond shape there where, okay, it worked for the first 15 minutes, but Brighton obviously reacted to it and they were simply bypassing it at that point. So that has to fall, that responsibility falls to Tenag, doesn't it? Did he stick with that system through stubbornness or naivety? Because he came out in his, his, after the game and he said, look, it worked. And it, it definitely did for the first 15. But after that, surely you have to change it, don't you? 
And he was, as you say, he was, he was out coached by yeah. Deserby on the touchline, wasn't he, in the end? Yeah, he was totally. And, you know, Brighton, just, they moved the ball so well there. Their bravery and possession and, and their movement to give each other options on, on passes and passing angles is, is phenomenal. That's all training ground work. United have maybe worked on this system for a few days, given it's the international break. I thought it was clear it, it needed to change. Um, I guess the options are pretty limited, but it, it, it felt noticeable after that first goal that United's quality just dropped. They didn't press. It took the stuffing out of them, didn't it? Really? Totally took the yeah, stuffing yeah. out of them. They never pressed again with the same intensity. They never played again with the same energy and intensity. Um, and I, I don't know whether that's physical. They've obviously had a lot of injuries this year. They should be fitter than ever, but they don't, they don't look it. The midfield, for me, is especially concerning. Um, I, I thought the midfield was shocking um, as the game wore on and just outrun by Brighton. Um, you know, there, there's a lack of energy there. They just they strike me at the moment as being really easy to play against. That's ten goals conceded in four games. Every one of those games, the midfield is just over, you know midfield's getting overrun. Um, and I think teams must be looking at United at the moment and thinking, yeah, give us give us some of that. They look they look a, they look a soft touch at the moment, and that they were again at the weekend. And like I say, teams are just finding it so so easy to create good chances against them and. It's not a surprise that the Brighton scored three goals when there's arguably only Man City are more attacking and more creative than, than Brighton in possession. So, you know, it's no great surprise, but you know, you're right, it did it did knock the stuffing out of them. They never played as well again. The body language became poor. Rashford had a really weird game in that he was United's most dangerous attacker, but just constantly making the wrong decision. Um I thought he was really selfish in the first half, to be honest. And at the start of the second, there was times when they were just better options on and he, he didn't look for them. The the goal, which we'll come on to, he, he had two chances to cross that before he ran it out of play. Um, and, you know, it, it was, it kind of summed it up that he was the most dangerous attacker, but he just kept making the wrong decision. Um, and yeah, they were, they were never really in the game after the first goal. I don't think you ever really thought they were, they were going to pull it back and it, it felt like it was always Brighton that, that were in the ascendancy. They couldn't get the ball, could they? That's the thing. I mean, Brighton kept possession so well. And they were just chasing, chasing shadows. And, and that, you saw that in the second half when you, you kind of discussed how tired they looked. And if you're going to be chasing the ball for, for that amount of time, you are going to look tired. You're bound to look tired for doing that for, for so long. If we stick with Ten Hag then, uh, then, then Tyrone, last season, fantastic first season at the club, Champions League football, a trophy, um, you restored connection again between fans and players, which has been absent. That, that was really important. And he's got, rightly so, a lot of credit in the bank. Rightly so. Um, but I've obviously saw, and, and this is justified, a lot of people raising their eyebrows now after, after that performance. It's been a very poor start of the season. Um, and I think that was obviously the most concerning because as we've just said, he was tactically outdone, wasn't he? Um, is it fair to have doubts or I guess little niggling doubts bubbling under the surface about Tenag or is it far too soon to, to kind of suggest that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say doubts just yet. I think there's, there's things that you look at that are maybe a concern like you say, he's got, he's got a huge amount of credit in the bank. I was having this conversation with someone last night. I mean, things would have to go spectacularly wrong this season for him to ever come under pressure. I think even if they finish fifth or sixth this year, which is entirely possible the way things are going, I don't think he'd be under pressure, particularly the, the top four race is very competitive. I think Brighton are major contenders in that. Um, Tottenham are looking really good. City, Liverpool, Arsenal is... There'd be no shame in finishing sixth, even though it'd obviously be a disappointing season. Is, is that right, though, after... I know he's only been given three signings and he should have been given more. And you look at someone like Harry Kane, who would have been the dream signing, and then they've ended up with a 20-year-old forward who, yes, he's got a vast potential, but he's still very raw. But on the face of it, he's still spent a lot of money. If I'm going to play devil's advocate, no, I 40, agree. 400 million yeah. now across his tenure. So would finishing fifth or sixth be, really be acceptable at, at this stage? I don't think it would be unacceptable to the point of him getting the sack. I think it would clearly be a disappointment um, it would clearly be a bad season. We have to open up our eyes to the fact that it's a possibility. I mean, you were reading out the odds for top four before, and I couldn't believe they, they were shocking. They were yeah, how, I mean, how the biggest price were. United were out of all the teams, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bigger price than Chelsea and Newcastle, apparently, which I find amazing. Um, but you, you can see why. I mean, they've played three. They've played three teams who would be rivals for top four, and have lost all three of those games so far. And although the Arsenal game was was very fine margins, there's no doubt Arsenal were the better team in that game. Um, and you're right I, I mean I said to someone after the game for £400 million 
they have got to be better than that. There, there are injuries there at the moment, but they have got to be better than that. That That is, you know, things have got to improve there. Anyway, I'd have a couple of concerns about Ten Hag at the moment. I, I think he'll find a way out of it, but the midfield, which I've mentioned, is the area he has most overhauled in this team, yet it looks the weakest area for me at the moment. And I just think, oh, I said this, I'm, it's like a broken record now, that he's tried to move it on tactically this season. They're clearly trying to be more dominant, more aggressive. They're, they're generally pressing higher up the pitch. They're playing a higher line. We've seen what they're doing from corners. They're, they're trying to just dominate games and dominate the opposition. And all it's really done has made them more open. And last season's success, they didn't score a lot of goals. It was built almost entirely on that defensive record and being very good at home and not conceding many goals. They kept a lot of clean sheets. They were good defensively. They relied on Rashford's goals. If they don't add any more goals to what they did last season, but they concede a lot more, then it's pretty obvious they're going to go backwards. And at the moment, that is what's happening. And it kind of feels to me, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I've not got, a, despite what that photo says, I've not got a tactical mindset to rival Ten Hag's, but it feels to me like he's trying to make United like his Ajax team were, in that now he thinks they're at the stage where they go and dominate teams, they dominate games. But the thing is, you know, it's it's a bit of a cliche, but the Premier League is clearly harder than the end of easy. The Nottingham Forest were two up at inside three minutes, three and a half minutes at United the other week. Brighton have just scored three goals here. You don't really get that as Ajax. You're allowed to dominate games. Does that system not rely upon pressing really well and efficiently? And if you look at that midfield at the moment, obviously you may see Mount side length injury. When he played the first few games, the midfield was probably unbalanced. They might have got it right for a few more games. So unfortunately, we've not had a chance to see Mount a bit more. But Christian Eriksen's come back into the side. He does lack legs. We know he can't press as effectively, which is why Mount was signed. And there's also a, probably a conversation to be had about Casemiro at the moment. Yeah. I was probably reluctant to accept it myself after watching the first few games, but he's not been at his best, has he? And if 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 it's two out of the three in, in the, the midfield who are underperforming, that's going to contribute to the issue, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And that, that's why I say I think the biggest issue is in midfield at the moment. It is There is just a lack of physicality, a lack of energy in there. Maybe Amrabat will improve it, but it just it feels to me like that midfield is is nowhere near physical enough. It is it is soft. It is a soft touch. I think they've been outplayed in midfield in every single game. Um, midfielders and attacking midfielders are just running beyond them. You look at the third goal at the weekend, and uh, you know at that point United were playing. Um, you know the tactical system was kind of all over the place. Fernandez was, you know, kind of dropping in at central defence and. The, the move starts and how Pedro's three yards in front of Fernandez, maybe. And that's, we, I've said before, that's what Brighton strikers do. They drop into midfield. And, you know, Fernandez just jogs back, really. He never tries to get goals. The, the, the concerning thing is, you can look at all of the goals and they're remarkably passive, all the players oh, for each of yeah. the goals. Incredible. Brighton had so much space and time, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, incredibly passive. Um, like I said, the first goal, I think, is a tactical issue that, you know, Ericsson's coming inside to stop the pass there. Then it goes wide to Veltman and he's got to get across. And, that's going to happen with that system. Um, the others, they are just really passive. The third, like I say with Fernandes, the second, McTominay gets across to Matoma, and McTominay and Dalai have got Matoma and Lamptey. Then they just stand off him. But that's what, with that goal, interesting enough, Dalo had a good game, I thought. But for the second goal, I actually placed blame on Dalo myself on watching that for the first time because the ball comes out of Matoma, Dalo's standing there. In my opinion, he should get out there, push tight to Matoma, stop the, stop the fire at the, at, the, at the source as such. But he lets McTominay, probably because of the system they're playing, it's McTominay's job to actually pick them up. But by that point, Brighton players have, have, have committed forward and the movement falls from there. Yeah, kind of it's, it, it kind of sounded like the confusion because it felt like... There was Matom confusion. You're yeah, right, yeah, McTominay absolutely. got there and got across and got out. Then kind of said, it almost, he almost pointed to Dallow and said, I'll have Matoma, you go on Lamptey, which is the wrong way, clearly the wrong way around. And neither of them got tight enough. And even, you know, Lamptey's pass was not aimed for Pascal Gross. But Gross is the one that reacts. Ericsson's flat-footed on the edge of the area. Um, and it, it's a Brighton central midfielder that reacts to it. And fair play, it was a lovely drop of the shoulder and finish. But, you know, it, it did sum it up. They were, they were second to everything, really. Um, second in terms of energy and movement and, and quality on the ball. And, you know, it, it, like you say, passive's a good word for it because the defending, especially in, in midfield, was incredibly passive all game. We'll leave it there for part one. Um, but we've got even more to talk about in part two, Tyrone. <laughs> Stay with us. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll be back in a moment for part two.
Welcome back to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast. And I guess we'll start by talking about the wastefulness in front of goal. Tyrone, it was a, a theme of last season. It's continued into, into this campaign. Marcus Rashford, who you touched upon in the first part there. For me, he's always been a confidence player. When it's going right, he's fantastic. And he, he does things on instinct. He doesn't really think about it. And he takes players on. He finds the back of the net. He's had a slow start to the season. I guess that can be excused because he was playing on the left, wasn't he, for the first few games? Sorry, he was playing down the middle for the first few games. He's now back on the left, so you'd expect him to start performing. You're right in kind of saying it was a weird performance because he was probably the most attacking, the biggest attacking threat. But in the final third, he did lack, his decision-making was poor, and he, he didn't have that cutting edge, did he? So what did you make of Rashford's overall display, really? Because, like, like I say, it was a bit of a... Bit of a confusing one, wasn't it, really? I it guess. was, yeah. He, he just tried to do too much at times, I think. Um, you know, there, there was a few occasions when he cut in and had the shot, and you could see why he did it. Um, you know, Van Hecker was clearly worried about him running at him, um, which, you know, he did He did a lot, and Van Hecker had an early book in. But the, the quality of his finishing wasn't there, and there was a few occasions. I mean, there was, there was an early chance, I think it was at nil-nil, when Steele saved with his legs. And even on that occasion... Rashford had the chances to pass there. I mean, I think he went right to the dead ball line before coming back in and the shot was from a tight angle as it was and that there was a chance to pass. Like I say, the goal, which you might come on to, well, the goal, the non-goal, um, he, he twice had chances to cross it. There was one in the second half where he went outside Van Hecker and hit it with his left foot and went into the side netting and you know, that was never really on. Um, Is that because he's frustrated? Do you think this decision making, he wants to do it on his own because he's looking at those around him and it's not been a good start of the season. He's yeah. thinking, right, do you know what? I'm just going to do it myself. Do you think that's where it comes from? Maybe, maybe with, with yeah. Maybe. He's, you know, he, he looks a very, what's the right word, maybe emotive player on the pitch. When things are going wrong, I mean, his body language in the second half on it's Saturday was really honest, poor. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's kind of just who he is. But, the, you know, there was one occasion where he, he just waited for the ball to come to him and Brian Player came and won it and the fans got frustrated. There was one where he just passed it straight to an opposition player and they countered and, rather than sprinting back or trying to get in shape, it was just sort of like a shrug of the shoulders and a what's going on. And, you know, his body language does get poor. Um, and yeah, maybe he tries to do too much. Maybe he was feeling confidence after his goal at Arsenal, which was a typical Rashford goal, cutting in and scoring on your left. But, you know, he, he did try to do too much. There was a couple of times where it felt like Hoyland was in a better position or at least an option on the cross and he didn't take it. And, I think he had eight shots in the game. He certainly had eight shots by about 55 minutes. Um, and it, it did kind of... High XG, this afternoon. some would say. Yeah, yeah, well, probably a high XG, yeah. I think only one of them was on target. Kind of kind of sums it up, really. Uh, Hoyland, obviously. Uh, I mean, I would have scored that, wouldn't I? I think so. Uh, it was a simple finish from close range. But nonetheless, look, we thought this was a fantastic start. There's a lot of pressure on his shoulders. So to get off the mark or to think that he got off the mark, he obviously wheeled away, he looked delighted, far reviews it. And that was another, I feel, a bit of a, bit of a blow, especially before half-time. That goal would have maybe changed the game, changed the momentum, yeah. changed the feeling in the dressing room at half-time. Um, but look, the ball was out. It was rightly chalked off, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, having played five-a-side with you last week, Stephen, I think by 40 minutes of a 90-minute game, you'd have been sent off, it's fair to say. Um, I'm, getting a re I'm getting an unfair reputation. You are getting a reputation. I, Unf I was, unfair I was, reputation. I was in two minds when I heard about your and Samuel's uh, incidents the other week, but now I'm, I'm firmly in camp locker stuff to uh, my ankles from the receiving end last week. I remember that. But yeah, it was... <laughs> um, it, it was 100% the right decision, you know, it was... Quite funny at half time listening to a few members of United staff and media staff who were saying it it, it wasn't and you know I think one said that the, they were guessing basically the officials and I just thought it looked clearly out from the from the replay from the from you know from the opposite side of the goal I thought you could clearly see grass between it I didn't think any of the ball was overhanging I didn't really feel it was that controversial a decision I think if that goes against you and it's given you know if that was on the other foot that had gone against United they'd be fuming um, you know we know how Ted Arg reacted at Arsenal to every minor decision that went against him and I think if if that if that if Brighton had scored that goal and it was given he would have been apoplectic so you know it was for me it was undoubtedly the right decision it was a simple finish I thought the, the good thing that Hoyland did for that goal was his movement his movement was probably underrated and that he was next to Dunk and just sort of backpedaled away from him quite quickly to to get the space to take a touch and, and finish so that was good um there was a good turn in the second half to, to play it to Rashford um for that chance where Rashford went on his left foot when arguably he should have crossed it. You know, there were there were some bright, some bright moments from Hoyland. I didn't think he was amazing. 
Um, probably was never a game he was going to look amazing in. It was his first start since May. There was there was some highlights, some good moments, um, and, and something to build on. I don't think that I don't know if we'll come on to the substitution, but well, that's what I was going to ask about you next. I was going to ask you next. Bizarre for me. You're chasing the game with just over. 20 minutes to play. I know potentially he might not be fit and that's what Ten Hag said in his press conference, didn't he, when he was asked about it. He also said it was a positive, the reaction, yeah. because yeah. Old Trafford, for the first time in, in Ten Hag's reign, showed the disapproval, didn't it, to one of his decisions. It did. That yeah. felt quite significant when, obviously, booing, booing the decision with Hoyland coming off, didn't it? It felt quite significant. Yeah, it did. It, it felt kind of like uh, honeymoon over territory, didn't it? It was... You know, I, I think I might have mentioned last week that a couple of people have said to me the season's got 2021, 2022 vibes. And I mean, I said that. That just sort I of said that. added to the feeling of it when substitutions are being booed and things like that. That You know, that happened so often in that season that it was like, oh, all right, okay, maybe maybe this actually is happening again. Um, I mean, I thought, you know, it was, I thought it was an obvious, obvious-ish decision with his fitness. Um, you know, he, he didn't start for Denmark in the international break. He played half an hour against San Marino, 45 minutes against Finland, played half an hour against Arsenal. Probably always going to be a big ass to play 90 minutes. I know you, you, what you're saying about chasing the game, but... Would a half fit Highland? I mean, physically he might not have been up to it, to be fair. Um, but would a half fit Highland not be better than Anthony Martial? Well, quite possibly. Who, I mean, who is always half fit as he is anyways? Yeah, it, it, it was kind of at that stage of the game where you've got your head buried in your laptop in the press box and you're not... You know, you're not watching it as vividly as you were in the first half, but I can't remember Martial doing anything, to be honest. Um, and yeah, maybe it's that argument. I guess the other argument is you, you're risking another injury with Hoyland if you keep him on. I did think he was tiring. I didn't think he'd really been involved in the game um, as much in the second half before he came off. Um, but yeah, the reaction, you know, the reaction was, wasn't just a few boos, it was virtually the entire ground. It was furious, really. Then a lot of people leave at 3-0. There's more boos at full time. Not as loud as for Hoyland, but there were more boos and yeah, it did. I, I, you know, I agree with you. It did feel significant. I don't think it's, you know, total mutiny territory yet. And I was clearly still got the support of the fans, um, but it did, you know, it did kind of feel like the first shot across the bows, I guess, in a way, um, the first sense of, of some frustration at, at what's been happening this season. I mean, I, I would say he's got a ton of credit in the bank and as I said, rightly so, but few uncomfortable questions maybe to ask to answer after that performance if we look at Casemiro then Ty we just kind of look, had a closer look at Marcus Rashford's performance I mean I just kind of suggested before there was a conversation emerging around Casemiro and yeah, it was fantastic last season he was instrumental in that team um, he is an older midfielder is he, is he 32 31, 31? I think, am, I, yeah. am I putting another year on him perhaps um, and 31 so, until he's 32 <laughs> So the signing was never going to be long term, was it? But is he showing signs of decline? Dare I say it? I've been, like I say, I've been hesitant to, to kind of suggest that, but I, I didn't think he was he was very good on Saturday afternoon. I don't think he's been very good for a few weeks now. No, I think he's been poor for most of the season. He's just given the ball away quite a bit, and his passing's been really poor, yeah. which has stood out to me. It has. He's, been, he's looked a little bit sluggish. Um, you know, I don't I don't think it's any secret. Well, it's not because Casemiro joked the Brazilian press last year about how much he likes his food and likes to eat. Um, love a barbecue, don't they? Yeah, they do love a barbecue, and he clearly there's a picture of him just on the wall behind, and you can see even even in that face, you can see how much he uh, he likes to he likes to eat. Um, so I don't think we're doing him a disservice to say that maybe he's not, you know, in in pre season he's he, you know he might be indulging a little bit, maybe a little bit more than some others. Um, he he looks sluggish so far this season, I think. Maybe he'll find his legs as the season goes on. But like you say, if you, if you are, if, if there are certain things you're not doing right, and we don't know that for certain, we're just guessing. In the jokes, the Brazilian press might be just him playing up to a bit of a reputation. But, you know, it seems to be a theme in Brazil. Um, but in, in fairness, as, as you've said, the, the players have looked tired. They've not looked the fittest side in the Premier League no, by haven't. any stretch, have no, they? No, I'm surprised at that. And uh, considering the identity of the team, how Tenog wants them to play, he always says, I want them to be on the front foot. Then you need to be physically fit. You need to be fitter than most teams. Yeah. But they don't look it, do they? Yeah. And that, that's a concern as well. It is. Well, they've probably played two teams who are really fit this year and whose manager wants them to be really fit. And Postacoglu of Tottenham and Desarbi's Brighton have both looked fitter than United. And like they've got more to give than, than United, which is a concern. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be writing Casemiro off just yet, but I do think he's been sluggish. It, I thought he started his career, he started United career like that last season. I mean, his first start 
against Real Sociedad last year. That's just, true. People thought, who, who's this? I what, know. Why, uh, yeah, 60 million? Yeah, I mean, he was he was all over the place that day. The the name that was being mentioned in the press box that day was Bastian Schweinsteiger. Um, you know, he, he clearly put those comparisons to bed. But he is, like you say, he is 31. He is of an age where you do slow down. And it's, you know, the older you get in, in football, the more you've got to do things right. You look at James Milner coming on for, for Bryson and, I know he won't be a popular example, but it's pretty clear he is someone who lives his life right and has lived it more and more right, if you will, as he's got older. I mean, it was, you know, the stories every summer about how he was still coming out on top in Liverpool's fitness tests. So, Benjamin Button, yeah, isn't he? James yeah. Milner, really? Exactly. He, you know, he's not drank for years, does everything exactly right. And you, you need to do that. And, I, you know, I've no idea whether Casemiro does or not. I know he plays up to the reputation in Brazil that maybe he doesn't. Um, so it... it he, he could be one of these players that hits uh, 32, 33 and suddenly it's just gone and he can't get it back. And it's, it gets harder and harder every summer to get back to those levels. And, you know, maybe maybe that's what's happening because I do think he's he's not started the season great and I do think he looks he looks a little bit sluggish. Well, let's hope he gets back to his best because when Casemiro is ticking, the team ticks. There's no coincidence, isn't it? When he's at his very best. Yeah, um, when, when he's, he's at his vital. optimum levels, yeah, it makes such a difference. Uh, we'll leave that there for, for part two and we'll be back in a moment for part three. Welcome back to part three of the Manchester is Red podcast now, Ty. I don't know if you can hear that rain hammering down, but that's probably reflective of the mood at the moment among United fans. I think there probably wasn't a spring in their steps going into their offices, respective workplaces this morning uh, after that. So where does this leave United? I mean, we don't want to be too hyperbolic in analysis. It has been a very poor start. Six points from five games. Um, who's next? Obviously Bayern Munich, which doesn't make it much easier, does it? Uh, so where does this leave Ten Hag in the, in, in the team really in the next week, in this week or so? He, uh, he's got problems to solve. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he was asked in his post-match press conference whether this was a crisis and he said it wasn't. I think it's it's very close to being a crisis purely because of the amount of things that are going on. I mean, we've spoken several times about the off-pitch issues, but they are incredible, really, at, at what's happening. You've got £158 million of right-wingers who just aren't available. Jaden Sancho in a hoodie watching the under-18s on Saturday rather than at Old Trafford. Who knows when Anthony's going to be back? Uh, Tanag said on Friday he doesn't know if Sancho will ever play for the club again. It's hard to see how it happens anytime soon. Tactically, what what he did on Saturday, like I said, I don't think it worked. Um, got issues to solve in the midfield, loads of injuries. You know, it's it, it's not a crisis just yet. I don't think, unless they get absolutely tonked in Munich, I don't think it'll be a crisis at that point. If they lose to Burnley, then I think we're definitely in that Burnley are rubbish. <laughs> Burnley are rubbish. Burnley have been Why rubbish. Why would be in that in yeah. that territory? Um, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to Bayern, the Bayern game. I mean, for me, it, as long as they don't get thrashed, it's a bit of a free hit because losing away at Bayern shouldn't really affect United's ability to qualify from this group. But what comes after that is is going to define the mood going into the October international break. Before we get on to that then, obviously, there were actually a few positives from the game. Um, Reguilón, who was making his debut, yeah, he was really good. Yeah. Uh, in attacking and uh, defensive scenarios, I thought he was really solid, as you say. And of course, Hannibal, who comes on and, and gets a goal. And I think I saw someone suggesting that he shouldn't have celebrated in the manner that he did. It was a mute celebration. It was a passionate celebration, wasn't it? And he kind of gave a reaction to the fans. And I think he's well entitled to do that. After a few years, he's been trying to break into the team. Finally, he gets his chance. And it was a great goal, wasn't it, from Hannibal? And, and great to see him coming on and making an impact. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like the fun police have been out in force. Ah, the, the flum, the, yeah, the fun police are always out on Twitter these they days. They are, aren't they? yeah, yeah. A lot of them, isn't there? Um, yeah, I didn't see anything wrong with the celebration. It's not like he ran to the corner flag and did a knee slide. You know, he didn't waste any time. He, he jumped up enthusiastically and waved to the fans to try and lift the atmosphere. And it worked, because for the next five or ten minutes... Well, maybe tends to push him. But for the next five, six, seven minutes, United were on the front foot. And if they'd have scored again at that point, you'd, you'd have said a, a result was possible. Um, so, you know, it, it did work in getting more out of them. It was a really good goal, well-taken goal, good finish. Um, I thought Martinez's pass into him actually was brilliant. Um, you know, that's, that's what we probably haven't seen enough of from Martinez this year that he can do. You know, his passing out from defence and breaking lines is, is superb. And that was a really good pass. Um, yeah, definitely a... You know, that, that was an, an encouraging moment for sure. 
be interesting to see how many games he gets this year. You know, it was no secret that United were on an R and over whether to let him go in in the summer window. Um, I mean, he was in the squad and Donny van der Beek wasn't on, on Saturday. There's obviously much more important questions to ask Ten Hag after the game than that, but probably quite telling that Hannibal was in that squad and, and van der Beek wasn't. Um, so I think it, you know, it makes it remarkable that van der Beek's still here, really, when he's, he's not getting in that squad. And if that's the pecking order now, Hannibal probably will get games. Um, you know, you look at the, the League Cup game coming up against Palace, that's probably a real chance for him to start if you're resting Fernandes. So yeah, he was a positive. And yeah, Regwell, I agree, I thought he started really well. Um, you know, they were talking about how aggressive United's press was in the first 15 minutes. He was really involved in that and won the ball high up the pitch in, in one instance and snapped into a couple of fierce tackles. So for someone who started two games in the whole of last season, it was it was pretty good, you know. That was his that was his first game in English football since April twenty twenty two, which was a home defeat to Brighton. So familiar familiar territory for him at least. But yeah, it, it was an encouraging performance from him for sure. He's blowing off the cobwebs, wasn't he? In, in yeah. bit of fashion. I mean, it, it feels a bit weird to say Reggion and Dallo had good games because they've lost three one, they've conceded three goals. But I, I felt they emerged with with some credit. Aaron Wambasaka was on the bench because he was unwell during the week. He obviously came on in the latter stages of the game. Considering Reguilón's performance and, and Dalo as well, um, does that give Tenaga a selection headache of some sorts for, for to, tomorrow's game? Sorry, Wednesday's game. Yeah, my days mixed up there against uh, Bayern Munich uh, across in Germany because wambasaka has been excellent all season. We've discussed this on the podcast. He was obviously won his place back toward the back end of, of, of last year. Um, so does he start? Does he come back into the team at the Allianz? Or? Depends on the, the system, I guess. I mean, I thought Dallow did pretty well against Matoma. Um, you know, I thought he'd get isolated a fair bit and would, would find it difficult, but he actually did do okay. I mean, I thought, I'd have been interested to see what the selection would have been like if Wambasaka wasn't, um, you know, if, if he was fully fully fit and fully well. I, I thought he'd pick Dallow because he was playing this narrow midfield and he's better at giving you width than Wambasaka is, which felt like a gamble because, I mean, Wambasaka's Best game last season for me was in the semi-final at Wembley when he completely nullified Matoma and was phenomenal against him. Um, so it felt like a risk, but that you know that does explain it. I guess it kind of depends what he's going to do now. In, are they going to go back to a four-three-three? Is he going to stick to this diamond? Um, you know, I, I guess you carry on playing Reguilon. I mean, you've signed him to play left back. He's got some minutes under his belt now. Right back. You know, I, I said it before. I, I don't think there's much between Wambasaka and Dallo and. I don't think there's much between them because both are brilliant. I think there's not much between them because both are good, basically. Um, it feels like a coin toss often, doesn't it? It's a coin toss, best. yeah, yeah. But it's not a coin toss between, you know, two world-class players. It's a coin toss, a coin toss between two right-backs who probably aren't quite good enough to be starting every week. Um, and I think that's that's something they've got to look at next summer that they need a right-back. But yeah, Dallow, Dallow was okay. Um, you know, pretty, yeah, probably better than okay, to be fair. He defended well against Matoma, who is a really really dangerous winger um, and wan has had a, a pretty solid season so be interesting to see who he goes with uh, yeah again it's I, th I think you'd have to toss, from, you can't continue with that diamond formation for me no uh, I wouldn't like I mean he said it was a success which yes for the first 15 minutes it worked but it was brutally bypassed after that yeah. um, four through three back to basics you know it works Bayern Munich aren't as good as Brighton I don't think ironically they've actually got better talent I mean, they scrambled home in the Bundesliga last season. They won it on the final day. Borussia Dortmund Chalk, they should have won that. I don't think it's quite clicked yet. I mean, I'm not an avid watcher of the Bundesliga tie. I'm not going to pretend to know everything about Bayern. I have watched them a few times because of Harry Kane, though, to, to, to have a closer look. But I don't think it's fully clicked yet for Tuchel out there. So I don't think it's going to... I mean, it's going to be a challenging game, of course, Bayern Munich away. Can they get a result? <laughs> Does that sound insane after uh, getting a tonk in off Brighton at the weekend? No, I think I think it's entirely possible they could get a result. I mean, Bayern drew at home at the weekend. They were playing Bayer Leverkusen. They were <clears throat> probably going to be their biggest challengers this season. They look a really good team. Um, but you're right. I, you know, I think there's there's probably doubts over Tuchel in in Munich. Maybe more doubts than there are over Ten Hag at, at United. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely not clicked. Um, been big changes again this year, but. They've they've had some decent results this season, but I think there's there's certainly still concerns there. There's been a lot of um, you know backroom changes there. I think you know they sacked the sporting director and one other employee one minute after winning the league last season. I mean that's pretty pretty remarkable. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely issues there. It wouldn't it's not beyond the realms of possibility 
<coughs> excuse me, the United can get a result. I mean, the, for all these comparisons with two years ago, I, I wrote it last week, the biggest difference is the manager that you would you'd expect Ten Hag to find solutions that Solskjaer never could. Um, so I certainly wouldn't rule them out going there and, and getting a result. I do feel they've got to tighten up. If they continue to give away chances, then the one thing we know about Bayern is that they're a team who can create a hell of a lot of chances. They've got very dangerous, very quick, wide players. Unpredictable, you'd say, wingers, um, but who on their day can can have a field day. They've obviously got Harry Kane. They've got Musiala, who's brilliant attacking midfielder. So I think you need to, the United need to tighten it up. They need to go back to basics. Um, if they have another game where they concede three goals, then that's you know that's going to be a major concern for them going into Burnley. But if they do tighten it up, you know it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they can get a result for sure. I tweeted out before we came and recorded this podcast to promote the MEN's uh, print supplement forty page on, on Twitter, and I said, "Look, I'm sure our fans will be excited to read about the Champions League campaign in a preview after getting beaten three one by Brighton. It doesn't have the same excitement level to it, does it? Really, it's dampened enthusiasm heading into that game. Definitely. Mm, well, I mean, we're already at the possibility where it might be easy for them to win the Champions League to get in it next year <laughs> rather than finish top four. It seems." <laughs> Uh, you're going to write that for your lunch piece this uh, afternoon? Not, not just yet. No, 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 no yeah, hold fire. Uh, what time do you fly tomorrow? Uh, 10.45. Out to Germany with uh, Samuel, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, direct direct to Munich. So Marriage counselling abroad? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Except well, I think we're... we're taking a continent. Separate, separate seats on the flight, so... But not separate rooms. Uh, very separate hotels. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, no, I think the marriage counselling has done the trick. So, uh, you know, maybe a night at Oktoberfest. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. We'll leave it there then, Ty. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks to listeners as usual. We're actually coming back tomorrow uh, with Tyrone and Samuel out in Munich for a quick little podcast. They're going to give you a rundown uh, of their thoughts ahead of the game. So come back tomorrow, check that out. And in the meantime, head across to YouTube, check out the Manchester Evening News' channel where we're ticking across nicely with subscribers and have a great week. Take care.